Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are listening to the Revolution Health Radio Show. This show is brought to you by 144.me. Now, if you don't know what 144.me is, it's a 14-day healthy lifestyle reset program. And if that's still a little vague for you, basically it's people like Chris and I who live busy lives and we have a hard time integrating diet, sleep, movement, stress reduction, all these components that go into making a very healthy life and a healthy family, sometimes it can be very hard to integrate them all at one time. And so what Chris has done is he's created a program called 14-4, and it's 14 days of incorporating these four factors into your life. And so it's very much a hand-holding program where step-by-step, you're going to be walked through like just how you actually implement dietary changes. How do you actually implement better sleep habits? How do you actually reduce your stress but not make it all about stress reduction because you have to move as well every day. So it's a really awesome program that you might want to do several times a year and it's something that a lot of people will be looking forward to doing something like this come January, um, which we're only a, a couple weeks away from. So if you don't have your New Year's resolutions planned out, check out 144.me. It might be something you want to try. So we're back to the Revolution Health Radio Show. I'm your host, Steve Wright from SCD Lifestyle. With me is integrative medical practitioner, healthy skeptic, and New York Times bestselling author, Chris Kresser. Chris, good morning. Morning, Steve. How's it going? It's going good, man. I'm just getting my first cup of coffee and starting the, <laughs> All right. the neurons to fire. I noticed, well, speaking of neurons, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I don't know if that was a coincidence or a, or a nice little lead-in, but I notice you have your, your similar white cave uh, in the background going now. Yeah, you know, RHR is getting really sterile these days. We're, <laughs> no. we're going to have to throw some hard work. We're all about audio quality, and, and we're suff- our, our, our scenic background is suffering as a result. Maybe we need to hang some pictures in here or something. Yeah, I think we need some family pics or <laughs> yeah. you know, logos or something. Something like that. So we have a, a great... Uh, show really interesting topic something I've covered a little bit in the past but we're gonna do it in a little a little more detail um, today we got a g- good question from Kevin well before we uh, jump into that question though did you uh, have any special breakfast this morning I did have something different I, I I'm happy to report it wasn't plantains <laughs> and eggs today um, so I had uh, some Greens, winter greens cooked in broth. So some is a combination of kale and collards, slow simmered in broth. This was from last night, so leftovers. Uh, I had some lamb kefta, which is like a, a spiced um, lamb patties that are made by a local charcuterie, which I've talked about before, the fifth quarter, um, which I really love. And then uh, some uh, purple purple flesh sweet potatoes, which are my my favorite types of sweet potatoes that are available in the fall. Um, pretty, they have like a really dense flesh. It's it's not as uh, watery as other kinds of sweet potatoes, and I add a little bit of butter on that and a little bit of sauerkraut. So good good breakfast. And we're ready to go. Talk about the brain. Awesome. Well, let's roll into it. Okay. So here's the question from Kevin. Let's give it a listen. Hey, Chris. I uh, just had a quick question about Alzheimer's disease and carbohydrate intake. Um, the only reason why is because recently the Mercola website has been putting out uh, a lot of articles uh, stating that any form of carbohydrate other than vegetable-based carbohydrates uh, it creates a sugar environment in the brain where the brain has to create energy by metabolizing sugar rather than what it should be using, which is uh, healthy fats. Uh, And they make no differentiation between um, simple carbs or complex carbs, really no differentiation between um, glycemic index, uh, where you've got sweet potatoes that have a good glycemic index, whereas maybe white rice would be a little bit more risky in that regard. Um, Is there any uh, basis to the claim that any non-vegetable-based carb is going to put your brain into an unhealthy state of processing sugars, uh, which could maybe ultimately lead to a diagnosis of Alzheimer's late in life? And I also wanted to comment that there is just no possible way as an active person who works out three to four times a week that I could... uh, get enough energy from vegetable carbohydrates. Um, I need uh, 100 to 200 grams of white rice or potatoes per day just to keep my energy levels up. 
And I uh, am concerned that since this is apparently a bad carbohydrate no matter what, um, that it's putting my brain into a uh, sugar processing state rather than a ketogenic state via healthy fats, and that this is a, a long-term agitator that might result in uh, an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Just curious your thoughts on that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, this is a topic that is, I think, beca- has become increasingly relevant over the past several years. I, I think it's pretty rare now to come across somebody, I'm sure almost everyone listening to this show, in fact, has been touched by Alzheimer's disease in some way, whether it's, you know, uh, a, f- a family member or a friend or uh, a colleague at work or someone in their life. I mean, it, it, it's it's become a really uh, uh, fairly shockingly common condition. And it's, it's, it's pretty terrifying, you know, uh, when, when it comes to things that you, that people fear, uh, in their old age, I'd say Alzheimer's <clears throat> is probably right at the top of the list because it's extremely destructive. Um, it's extremely uh, trying and, and challenging for people who are living with someone with Alzheimer's. Uh, in fact, I, I remember reading a statistic that um, caregivers of Alzheimer's patients have, you know, among the highest levels of, of stress of, of anybody that, that they've measured in terms of stress hormones. It's one of the most stressful situations that you can be in. So it's a, it's a big problem and it seems to be getting worse and worse. Um, so I'm happy to have a chance to talk about it a little bit. I will point out that I, I wrote an article a while back that kind of addressed this question. It's called, it was called, uh, do carbs kill your brain? And so if you want the cliff notes version, you can, uh, Google that and it should come right up to the top of the list, but we're going to go over this in a little bit more detail. So this going all the way back to the, uh, great starch debate. It's, it's, yeah, it's related to that, but it actually, I wrote that article after uh, Dr. Perlmutter's book came out and, uh, you know, I, I, I think he's done some fantastic work and I applaud the, his crusade against, um, you know, industrial diet, processed and refined carbohydrates and food. But I think that he's taken things a little bit too far in terms of associating all carbohydrates with brain disease. And I don't think there's a strong basis for that claim at all in the, in the evidence-based uh, literature. Um, uh, Alzheimer's, like many other inflammatory diseases, is a disease of civilization, which we're, you know, we're going to talk more about what, what that means. But um, I think, you know, when you, when you, it's, when you look at the history of, of, of diet uh, policy and and ideas around what's healthy and what's not, uh, you know, for for both for weight loss and and metabolic problems and other conditions. Early on, there was a really big focus on calories, you know, and, and all of the the diets were focused on lo- reducing your calorie intake, and and then the focus really switched to fat, and the idea was that fat was bad and co- the cause of all the problems, so we should all be on really low fat diets. And, and that was really dis- destructive. Um, uh, now the pendulum has swung in the other direction where carbs have become the new evil macronutrient that is, are, are purported to be the cause of every problem. And my, you know, while I do appreciate some of the efforts that have been made to exo- exonerate fat and, and um, you know, uh, point out the... the potential risks of excess refined carbohydrates, my concern is that this is, we're just going, we're just doing the same thing we've done, which is demonizing a whole entire class of food and uh, macronutrient in this case, uh, instead of focusing on what the real issue is, in my opinion, which is the quality of the food that we eat, not the, not even the quantity although that matters, that's primarily influenced by the quality though, and not the quantity of macronutrients. So it's not primarily important in my opinion for most people what quantity of fat or protein or carbohydrate they eat, but what is most important is the quality of those macronutrients. So um, getting your macronutrients from whole, unprocessed, real foods 
is probably the, the single most important thing that, that the vast majority of people need to focus on. Now, granted, there are people who have health conditions that require some tweaking in macronutrient ratios, and I talk about that in my book, and we've talked about that a lot on this show. But in general, uh, quality is far more important than quantity. And we know this from looking at the anthropological record and looking at things through an evolutionary lens. Uh, as I said before, Alzheimer's, like many other modern diseases, is a disease of civilization. It's not something that's typically observed in traditional populations that are following their ancestral diet. Um, we, we know that, there, that humans can thrive on a wide variety of macronutrient ratios. We've discussed this ad nauseum on the show. Uh, Cultures like the Inuit and Maasai who've eaten relatively high fat diet and low carb intake who um, are healthy and, and relatively free of modern disease. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have cultures like the Kitaba and the Tukasenta and the traditional Okinawans who ate a, a, a large percentage of their calories from carbohydrate and pretty low fat intake and were uh, virtually free of, of modern inflammatory disease. So... These are just examples of how it's not the quantity of the macronutrients that matters, but the quality. Because what the, what all of those cultures weren't eating is cheese, cheese doodles, and you know, <laughs> big gulps and candy bars, and uh, you know, lots of refined flour and and all of the stuff that really uh, comprises or constitutes the basis of the American diet. I mean, seventy percent of calories now in the American diet comes from flour, sugar, seed oils, dairy products, and alcohol. That's a mass. So, so that's the, the majority of what people eat are coming from that. And so we're not seeing an epidemic of disease because people are eating way too many bananas or, you know, way too many apples or too many sweet potatoes. We're seeing an, ep an epidemic because people are eating junk. That's, that's what, is happening in the industrialized world and you know another example another uh, example of this is is Weston Price and the research that he did he um, he studied traditional cultures who, who weren't just following paleo type of diet they were following a, a traditional diet that actually even included things like whole grains and and legumes which you know of course most uh, paleo advocates would, would say uh, contribute to disease and, and I say that those things probably don't contribute to disease in the context of a nutrient-dense healthy diet. I mean they may cause problems for some people who already have diseases, gut issues, etc. You know we, we do recommend people avoid them for that reason but once again you don't see big epidemics of disease and populate like when Price studied that the, the, um, the Gaelic the traditional Gaelic populations, the uh, traditional Swiss populations in the Lochental Valley, uh, and these were people that were eating a fair amount of, of soaked and fermented grain products in addition to dairy products and, and then, you know, other real foods. And there was no evidence of, of modern inflammatory, significant modern inflammatory disease in those populations either. So really... We see these diseases taking off when we see the introduction of white flour, uh, industrial seed oils, and excess sugar. Those, that's the, the, the trio. Um, uh, and, of course, on top of that, uh, all of the other processed food that comes in bags and boxes that has become a mainstay of the American diet. But that's not all. You know, we also have a disrupted gut biome. That's become increasingly clear that our gut microbiome has changed dramatically even in the last 30 to 50 years, and that's had a profound influence on our health and our brains via the gut-brain axis, which we've talked about a lot. There are things like environmental toxins, stress, increase in chronic stress, uh, decrease in sleep in, in the last 50 years. Uh, we've gone from sleeping an average of eight hours a night to, in many cases, sleeping an average of six hours of sleep. So we've lost a couple of hours of sleep in 50 years. That's a profound impact on brain, brain health. Uh, not enough exercise. And then there's some evidence that chronic infections may play a role in things in, in, in certain brain disorders. So 
I'm actually not even aware of a single study correlating the development of Alzheimer's with consumption of carbohydrates from natural sources like fruits and, and vegetables. And the, the problem is that most of the studies look at carbohydrates as a, as a whole class and they don't differentiate between different kinds of carbs. Those studies will show an association between carbs and brain disorders. Why? Because 80, over 80% 80 of, of the carbohydrates that are consumed in the U.S. are in highly refined form. So we're talking about sodas, flour, you know, cookies, crackers, cake, muffins, bread, cereal. You know, I, this is all the stuff that the average American is eating on a daily basis. And they're not eating sweet, you know, sweet potatoes, plantains, yucca, taro, not even whole White grains. White potatoes, rice. Like, even, even whole potatoes or rice. Yeah, this is, these are things that are not commonly eaten. Uh, and, and so to blame condition like Alzheimer's on those nutrient dense starches and whole fruits, I think is just is completely unfounded and, um, and problematic because it's pushing people to a very low carb diet and which we've discussed again, like I wrote a whole series about that. There's even an ebook available now on my site about that. Um, low carb diets, they can be therapeutic in some cases, but they can cause a lot of harm in people um, who aren't well suited to them. So, yeah, I mean, this is really scaremongering, is what this is in the alternative community. I mean, the people listening to this show, I think, you know, hopefully the show will reach a bigger, bigger audience who needs to hear that whole foods are the key. But the idea that Every protein's the same, every fat's the same. We talk about the difference between industrial seed oils, the difference between healthy fats. And now for us to, as an alternative health community, to lump all carbohydrates together is just bad science among it's it's irresponsible. You know, I think so too, Steve. And it's it's always been just crystal clear to me, but it's amazing to me that there's still a debate about that. You know, <laughs> like it, it there's still people who are hanging on to that idea that all carbs are the same no matter where they come from in spite of the overwhelming amount of evidence that suggests that that's not true. Um, I, you know, I think part of the issue that makes this confusing for people is that uh, a ketogenic or very low carb diet can be really therapeutic for a lot of conditions, including Alzheimer's. And so the assumption is then made that because it's therapeutic, because removing carbs in your, from your diet is therapeutic for a particular condition, then that means that carbs were the problem in the first place. And, and it is easy to see how someone could make that um, leap, but it's actually a, a fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. It, those two things don't go together necessarily. And let me give you uh, some other examples where that uh, assumption could be made, but is, is obviously untrue. So one would be hemochromatosis, uh, which is a disorder of excess iron storage. So when you have hemochromatosis, um, you know, most people when they eat iron, eat foods that contain iron, they only absorb the amount of iron that they need and then they excrete the rest of it. But people with hemochromatosis, their body isn't able to sense how much iron they already have stored and they end up absorbing more iron from the food than they need rather than excreting it. And they iron accumulates in their body over time and that causes problems. So uh, of course, as you can imagine, one of the treatments for hemochromatosis is reducing your intake of iron. Makes sense, right? But that doesn't mean that everybody should eat less iron, nor does it mean that eating too much iron is what led to hemochromatosis in the first place. It's not caused by eating too much iron. It's actually caused by a genetic mutation that leads to that excess iron storage and that disruption in iron metabolism in the first place. Another example um, that a lot of people will be able to relate to is pe that people with celiac disease or gluten intolerance need to avoid gluten. But that doesn't mean that eating gluten is what originally caused the celiac disease uh, or the gluten intolerance. Otherwise, every single person that ate gluten would have celiac disease or gluten intolerance, but that's not actually true. Um, celiac has a genetic predisposition, as does not uh, possibly non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And there are also a bunch of environmental factors that triggers that, that can uh, 
increase the risk of celiac developing, like leaky gut. Uh, Dr. Fasano, who we've had on the show, believes that leaky gut is a precondition for developing any autoimmune disease, including celiac disease. So you have a genetic predisposition plus, for example, taking antibiotics when you're a kid or not being breastfed or being born by a C-section, disrupts your gut microbiome, and then that predisposes to the development of celiac disease. So that's a second example. And, uh, you know, a third example might be that people who don't have a gallbladder may need to limit their fat intake a little bit because bile is really important, you know, helpful in, in um, breaking down fats. And people without a gallbladder don't produce as much bile. But eating a lot, a higher fat diet is not the usually the cause for gallbladder disease and, and, and having to have your gallbladder removed in the first place. In fact, gluten intolerance is one of one potential cause of having your uh, gallbladder removed and, or that can lead to having your gallbladder removed. So I hope you can see, you know, from these examples that the fact that a low carb diet is therapeutic for a certain condition does not mean that carbs led to that condition in the first place. And this again, is just, it, it's common sense, but uh, I can see how people could, could get thrown off by that or confused by it. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit. Yeah, and, and my anger, and I think Chris's passion as well, is not directed towards those people who are trying to make sense of this condition. It's directed at the people who are giving out information regarding this condition. Because, you know, when you when you do have somebody in your life who's sort of beginning to forget what life is and who they are, I mean, it's very tragic. And so you want answers like now. And yeah. it it when when the pain is this great in a condition like Alzheimer's, I think it's very easy to to try to just jump. Like you just want to make change fast as possible. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I, I think, uh, like I said, I think Dr. Perlmutter has done some great work and I think he really believes in what he's, um, doing, doing and saying, and I don't, you know, uh, I mean, actually, I don't really know. I've never talked to him about that. I know he's gone on Rob's show and he said, yes, he does really believe that everybody needs to be on a, on a really low carb diet, even athletes. And so I think he just has a, he has a different perspective on things, but, um, I guess, you know, I just, I think it's, uh, from, from where I'm coming, I'm coming from a place where I, I see actually potential harm in that approach because I work with patients who've been harmed by that approach, as I've said many times before, and I, I don't see the evidence supporting that idea that their, you know, natural carbs, uh, can, can, can contribute to diabetes. In fact, we have quite a bit of evidence to suggest the opposite. When you look at studies, and I, and I mentioned these studies in the Do Carbs Kill Your Brain article, uh, and there's one that actually has recently come out that was uh, that came out after I wrote that article that, um, you know, just a few days ago, actually, that showed that people in the highest quintile uh, or, or quartile of fruit and vegetable consumption, so they divided, you know, these people into groups based on how, how much fruit and vegetables, they how many fruit and vegetables they ate on a daily basis. And the people that were in the highest um, group in terms of consumption had an 81% lower risk of developing diabetes than people who ate the least amount of fruits and vegetables. And so, you know, we, we don't, when you, when you see studies that actually look at consumption of whole food sources of carbohydrates, you... And even studies that have just looked at fruit independently from vegetables have seen almost always that there's an inverse relationship between the amount of fruit and vegetables that somebody eats and their risk of getting diabetes. And to me, that just goes to show that when a study shows that carbs are contributing to diabetes, whether we're talking about type 2 diabetes or type 3 diabetes, which is what Alzheimer's has been referred to, it's not coming from fruits and vegetables, you know, that's, it's coming from the industrialized uh, products that we've been talking about. So let's, uh, now that we've got out of the way, that out of the way, let's talk <laughs> a little bit about um, what, you know, what is actually happening with Alzheimer's and what might be some of the uh, options in terms of dealing with it. Um, because I hope I've established that eating nutrient-dense carbohydrates does not contribute to it. Um, but uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about 
what you might do if if it's already there, you know, for a family member or, or someone that's dealing with it. And this is, again, just as a reminder, be ultra, ultra clear, this is separate from what you would do to, pre to prevent because they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so Alzheimer's disease essentially involves abnormal metabolism in the nerve cell and there's uh, evidence that, that these nerve cells in people with Alzheimer's can't produce processed glucose in the normal fashion to meet the cell's energy needs and that's due to insulin resistance in the neuron that makes it hard for the brain to use glucose. And when not enough glucose can be burned efficiently, then the neurons are prone to uh, not working properly, malfunction, and even death. And so the principle behind using a very low-carb diet as a therapy for Alzheimer's is that when the carbohydrate intake is restricted, ketones will be produced. So this is a ketogenic diet. And the brain can use those ketones as an alternative fuel source to substitute for glucose which in turn will improve the function of cells and maybe even stop them from dying. Okay, so um, that's, again, doesn't mean that eating too much glucose causes metabolic problems or insulin resistance in the first place, but once those problems are there, then um, switching to ketones as the primary fuel source for the brain instead of glucose can be therapeutic. And ketones are, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, they're, they're made in the liver from fatty acids or amino acids. And uh, according to the studies I've seen, about 60% of the brain's energy needs can be met by ketone bodies. So if a nerve cell or neuron only has 40% capacity to use glucose, then the ketones could conceivably uh, could compensate completely for uh, for the glucose that that cell would otherwise be using and it could make up for the, the shortfall in function. And this actually, the brain's ability to use ketones actually is an, is an evolutionary adaptation that came out of times in our history when glucose was scarce. So for example, during periods of extreme food scarcity or during periods where there was a shortage of carbohydrates in the diet. And you know, the brain is the, the most important organ in the body. And so our, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we needed to evolve a way where the brain would work in pretty much any circumstances, environmental circumstances, regardless of what types of food were available. Um, and it, what's interesting to me is that people have said, oh, oh, you know, this, this is our sort of optimal desirable state. When you consider the evolutionary perspective, you can see that this was an adaptive mechanism for very extreme circumstances, right? Circumstances that weren't likely to be encountered by most people during most of their lives. So to me, it's, it's an adaptation that can be used when things, you know, when it's necessary, but it's definitely not our, our default state. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not our default state or necessarily even our optimal state. It's, this is an adaptation for for pretty extreme circumstances. So, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion of how you actually put this into practice is probably beyond the scope of this show, but I do want to hit a couple of highlights. Um, Paul Jaminet from Perfect Health Diet has written about using ketogenic diets for brain disorders, and uh, Kurt Harris, who some of you might remember from back in the day as a, a very popular paleo blogger, has not been blogging for, for quite some time, but he's a friend of mine and I, I stay in touch with him. I know he's done a lot of research and work on this subject and he shared it with me. He hasn't written about it publicly, but both Kurt and Paul, who are really smart uh, guys and, and have spent a lot of time looking into this, um, their approach, which is my approach as well in the clinic, um, is to force ketone production with high amounts of medium chain triglyceride like MCT oil or coconut oil rather than using a super, super low carbohydrate diet. Uh, so for example, in a typical ketogenic diet might be limiting carbs to 25 grams per day, including carbs from non-starchy vegetables. Um, and my approach and Paul's approach and Kurt's approach would be more like using a higher 
a high level of uh, MCT oil, you know, maybe like a 50-50 mix of MCT and coconut oil and, you know, six to nine tablespoons a day of that to force the ketone production and restricting carbs, but not restricting them so heavily. So we might go for like 70, 50 to 75 grams of carbohydrates, um, but not even counting carbohydrates from non-starchy vegetables. So just counting them from fruit and starch and limiting to maybe 50 to 75 grams and using like the keto sticks to, to you know, see how much carbohydrate you can tolerate and still remain in ketosis with that level of MCT and coconut oil. Um, and the reason for that is that there are some potential side effects from being on an ultra low carbohydrate diet over a long period of time. And those can be largely mitigated by eating, you know, 50 to 75 or even 100 total grams of carbohydrates. Um, and you still get the benefits of being in ketosis. So, so that's, um, that's a, I think, the best approach in, in, in these kinds of circumstances when a ketogenic diet is necessary. And uh, maybe in another show we'll get more into the details of how to do that or I'll write an article about that if there's some interest in it, which I imagine there, there would be given how prevalent these problems have become. So I think that's it, Steve. Any, uh, anything else that uh, comes well, to mind? I think a, a big takeaway that, you know, to, in case people didn't grasp it yet, is that you will alter the fuel that you feed the system based on how the system's doing. So, for instance, um, if you buy a diesel truck, you're going to put diesel fuel in it. You're not going to put uh, high-octane airplane fuel or regular-grade um, car fuel in it because it's a different type of engine. And that analogy could transfer over. Some of us have Ferrari engines. Some of us have diesel engines. Some of us have just regular uh, Volkswagen engines. And based on whatever, how you're running the system, you're going to need different types of fuel. So the fuel source really matters um, that you get the right fuel source based on how the engine is. And so I think that's really important for the discussion both pre-disease and then after sort of diseases started to set in. We always have to kind of match those things. Yeah, exactly. And one of the main points I made in my book or tried to make was that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And not only that, there's no one size fits all approach for one person throughout their life. So yeah. uh, and that's what you were just getting at, Steve. Uh, it could be that earlier on in life, uh, a higher carb, lower fat diet for whatever reason would make somebody feel better. But uh, then later on in their life due to changes in that, you know, maybe they took a lot of antibiotics early, early on and later in their life and their gut or they got a bunch of parasites and their gut microbiome got really screwed up and then that caused a systemic inflammatory condition and leaky gut, which in turn led to uh, development of epilepsy or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's later in their life. Maybe they were burning the candle at both ends or whatever and they develop Alzheimer's and then the diet that they were eating before that was working for them well is no longer going to work because their glucose metabolism in the brain has become impaired and they need uh, ketones to substitute for that. So it's, it's really all about listening, pay, you know, paying attention, listening to your, your body's needs, you know, using smart testing and diagnosis to figure out what your body's needs are and then adjusting your diet and lifestyle as you go based on those things. And that's what the idea of a personal paleo code is uh, because it's really not simple. You know, it's, it's, we share a lot in common, but we have a lot of important differences. So uh, this is why it's not possible to prescribe one approach that will work for, for everybody or even one approach that works for one person throughout their entire life. So well put. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful and uh, let us know if you want us to go into more detail about implementation um, of the ketogenic approach. It's, I think generally it's best to do under the supervision of someone who's skilled in this because there are a lot of moving parts and there are uh, definitely things to consider um, but but perhaps you know we can cover it to to some degree without um, being irresponsible about it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. 
Well, Chris, this is our uh, this is the end of basically our Thanksgiving show as we head into the holidays here. I just want to say that I'm grateful for you, grateful for the work that you do. I'm grateful for the listeners out there who listen to this show. Thank you, Steve. I'm grateful as well for your support and Jordan's behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, I mean, all of you folks who are hearing this, it'll be a couple of weeks after Thanksgiving by the time you hear this. But I hope you had a great holiday and, and uh, lots of uh, joy and connection with family and rest and um, you know, going into the holidays uh, in December. I wish you the same. And we'll be back next time. We sure will. And in between episodes, if you're looking for more information from Chris, like things on carbohydrates as they come out in the research, make sure you're following him on Facebook. Uh, go to facebook.com forward slash Chris Cresser LAC and twitter.com forward slash Chris Cresser. Thank you for sending in your questions. Please keep doing that in between shows, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. 